twas the most profound birth. As a man, God entered the earth. The word became flesh, our spiritual cure. A child was born, a son was given. Our blessed savior lay in a poor manger. And to some shepherds an angel appeared with good news that made a multitude of heavenly hosts cheer. They went out to behold Emmanuel without any fear. Now I wonder, when those shepherds laid eyes on Jesus for the first time, did they know what would be of his endeavor? Did they know he was the great I am and not just a great teacher? Did they know that one day he would raise the dead and that he was in fact their redeemer? I wonder. Did they know he would bring sight to the blind or that he would even heal a Samaritan leper? I wonder. Did they know that one day for their sins he would die and on a cross would be crucified, but then three days later from the grave he would rise? We do know this, that God sent them to witness this miracle at that appointed time. So we would like to welcome you at this appointed time to hear the same good news that came to those shepherds who were just like you and I.
Luke 2, 1 through 14. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar, Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the flock field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. stand and join with us in singing. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echo in their joyous strains. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh, oh.
praise the Lord, the newborn King. At this time, uh, here at Crosspoint, we, we always love to uh, provide a story time uh, for the kids in the congregation. Uh, so parents, uh, at this time, if you want to send your kids up to lay here on the uh, carpet up on stage uh, to hear a Christmas story uh, from the director of our children's ministry, Harmony Rogers. fancy. Oh, there we go. All right. Oh, come on up. You can make it. You got it. Good job. All right. We are going to read The Very First Christmas by Jan and Mike Berenstein. Do you want to sit up here? Yeah? Come on up. Oh, we got you. Here we go. That's better. All right. Let's see here. The bear cubs love Bible stories, and Papa Bear loves reading them to his cubs. It's Christmas Eve, cubs. Time to settle down for the night, Papa said. Are you going to read to us before we go to sleep, Papa? asked sister. Honey clapped. Please, she asked. Papa smiled. Of course. How about a story from our storybook Bible? How about the story of the very first Christmas, asked brother. The very first Christmas it is. A young woman named Mary lived in the city of Nazareth. An angel came from God to give Mary wonderful news. The angel greeted her and said, you are blessed by the Lord. Mary was afraid, but the angel comforted her saying, fear not, for you are special to God. You will have a baby boy who you will name Jesus. He will be called the Son of the Highest. Mary said, how can this be, since I'm not yet married? With God, nothing is impossible, the angel told her. And Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord. At that time, everyone in the Holy Land was to be counted and put on a list. Mary was going to marry Joseph, whose family came from Bethlehem. So they had to travel to Bethlehem to be counted, even though it was almost time for Mary to have her baby. When Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem, it was very crowded. The only place they could find to stay was at a stable at an inn. It was warm and dry, and that is where Mary had her baby. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger where the animals ate. Nearby, shepherds were watching over their flocks. An angel came to them in a bright light, and they were afraid. Don't be afraid, said the angel. I bring good news for everyone. Today, Christ the Lord is born. You will find the baby lying in a manger. Suddenly, other angels joined him, saying, Glory to God, peace on earth. The shepherds hurried to Bethlehem. They saw Mary and Joseph with baby Jesus lying in a manger. Then they told everyone what they had seen. The king has been born, they all shouted joyfully. After Jesus was born, wise men came from the east to the holy city of Jerusalem. 
They asked, where is this child who was born a king? We've seen his star and we followed it to worship him. King Herod, who ruled the land, heard about the wise men and their journey. He was worried. Who was this child that people called a king? He told the wise men to find the child, and when they did, to tell him where he was. The wise men followed the star that went before them. It led them to the house where Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were staying. The wise men bowed down and worshipped Jesus. They gave him gold and other precious gifts. God told them in a dream not to go back to King Herod. So they left and traveled back home another way. An angel came to Joseph in a dream and told King Herod, told them that King Herod was angry with them. He was to take Mary and Jesus to safety in Egypt. So Joseph, Mary, and Jesus traveled to Egypt and lived there until King Herod was dead. Then they went back to the town of Nazareth in the Holy Land, and that is where Jesus grew up. And for the rest of the story, you can come to Kid Point tomorrow. Good job, guys. Good job. Will you guys stand with us and sing another song?
You guys may be seated. Christmas. I want you to stop for a moment and consider the word true. You know, it has a definite meaning, actually several meanings. If you go to merriamwebster.com and type in true, you'll see that that which is true is in accordance with the actual state affairs. State of affairs. True can refer to that which is ideal, that which is essential, that which is consistent, that which is legitimate, or that which is rightful. It is the word true that the Apostle John actually used to describe Jesus. We've come here tonight, we've gathered together, not because we all wanted to go out in frigid temperatures and brave, crazy, icy, snowy roads. We've gathered together not because we don't have anything better to do. It's Christmas Eve and everybody's got more to do than they've got time to do it. We didn't gather together because we wanted to see what each person was wearing or because we had a few hours to kill. No, we've gathered together tonight to celebrate the birth of the one true light. Take your copy of God's Word, if you have one with you, please, and find John chapter number 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's all right. The words will be up on the screen as we read through this text together. The Apostle John, of course, is writing this book, this gospel, this message, and he wants to establish something, and that is this, that the the important thing, the, the necessary thing, the vital thing is that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and in believing, you will be saved through faith in him. And so John begins by pointing people directly to Jesus Christ. Look with me at verse number nine in chapter number one. God's word says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John's message in these verses is simple. Jesus is the light who came to make an eternal difference. Prior to Jesus' birth, his arrival on this planet in his incarnate personhood, uh, the Jews had experienced 400 years of silence from God. Those were times of darkness, times of desperation. They were times that were devoid of any real hope to which they could anchor their lives to. But Jesus' arrival fulfilled God's promise because he promised all the way back in Genesis chapter number three that he would send somebody to deal with the problem of sin. And he said that he would send that person through a woman. We know that woman uh, to to be Mary, the one who uh, conceived Christ of a virgin conception. And and she gave birth to him. And that's the event. That's the, the extraordinary thing that we're celebrating this season. And back in Genesis 3, the promise was made. The serpent will bruise your heel, but you will bruise his head. The, the one who comes from you will bruise his head. Jesus was the promised one. And his arrival fulfilled God's promise to his people and to all who believe. believe. Therefore, Jesus is the true, the genuine, the one and only light of the world. Now, many people think, and maybe you're among them today, that all or nearly all religions are the same because they all make some sort of promise of salvation, some sort of hope to the faithful. But please hear this and please hear this well. There is, in fact, only one way of salvation. And and the reality is we need spiritual eyes to see that truth. And that vision to see that truth, it comes only by the grace of God, through the Word of God, and by the Spirit. 
And the reality is that God did not hide the fact that Jesus is the light. Later on, Jesus would say of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But, but God wasn't trying to hide the reality that Jesus is that one true light, the only hope of salvation, the only hope of abundant life now, the only hope of everlasting life with God forever and ever. In verse number 9, John starts out inspired by God himself, the true light, that's Jesus, which gives light to everyone. The reality is God promised to send Jesus into the world that he created to save sinners. And and every person is exposed to the light of God's Son. But as importantly, the light of God's Son exposes every person. The light of God's Son exposes us in our sin, in in our helplessness, in our hopeless condition, The light of God's Son exposes the fact that we, in fact, need a Savior because we cannot save ourselves. And so John writes, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And Jesus makes an eternal difference. How? Well, John recorded two reactions to the light. First of all, some see the light and reject it. John revealed that Jesus is the one who created the cosmos. He was the the one who God used as the, the creative instrument by whom and through whom everything that was made was made. He talked about that up in verse number one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. And He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Not only is Jesus the, the, the instrument, the tool whom through whom God created all things in this world that we know and enjoy and and in the universe that we observe and see. But he's also the one, according to Colossians 1, who sustains every bit of it by the word of his power. And so John is saying this true light, this light that gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. In verse number 10, he says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. It came to be through his creative effort. But then notice what it says. Yet the world did not know him. The world that he made did not acknowledge him, that did not recognize him as creator, as Lord. But John digs a little bit deeper. It's not just the world in general that did not know him. He goes on to reveal, to expose that Jesus came to his own, the the ones to whom he was promised. The ones who had the law. The ones who had the Old Testament, the ones who had all of the the ceremonial rituals that they went through that in fact pointed to Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the sacrificial Lamb of God. He came to His own, but notice what the Bible says, and His own people did not receive Him. They failed to recognize Him as the promised Messiah. Therefore, they did not acknowledge Him as Savior and did not accept Him as Lord. They did not know Him. I think that's the condition of a lot of people today. They know things about Jesus. They know pieces and parts. But they don't acknowledge the fullness of who He is. They don't acknowledge the fullness of what He did and what He came to do. Please understand this. You can believe that Jesus was born as a baby and lived to do great things. You can believe that Jesus taught profound lessons and even died on the cross. But if you don't believe that Jesus is God's Son, that He is the only one qualified to be the substitute for sinners, that He is the only, the one and only hope of salvation, then His birth, His life, His death, His resurrection, they will make no eternal difference for you whatsoever. Many people see part of Jesus, but not the whole picture. So what do they do? They, They reject Him as the way of salvation. But in verse number 12, John provides for us a contrast. 
but to all who did receive him. To all who did acknowledge him, to all who did recognize him, to those who who realized that this is the one who has promised us and he has now come to earth. To all those who did receive him, why would they receive him? Because they believed in him. They believed what they saw. They believed what they heard. They believed what they then knew to be true, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah sent from God to be the one and only Savior. To those who believed in His name. What does that mean? In His name encompasses the entirety of who Jesus is and and what Jesus came to do. To those who believed Him, they received Him, and they received then from Him the right to become the children of God. Think about that for a minute. They received the right to become. I think adoption is... A beautiful, beautiful thing. And many of you have adopted, and my wife and I have never had the, the, the ability or the, the opportunity to adopt, but I think adoption is a beautiful thing when you truly think about it. But let me tell you what adoption is not. Adoption is not about a child deciding that he or she wants to be part of a certain family. Adoption, by its own very essence, requires the decision by the adoptive parents to extend grace to a child who is entirely helpless and unable on his or her own to become part of a family. Those who choose to adopt the child they will adopt, they then give that child the right to become their child. And by becoming their child, they then give that child the right, the opportunity to receive all of the the blessings and the benefits of being part of that family. And, and, And friends, that's what Jesus does for those who believe in Him and receive Him as Savior. He gives them the right to become the children of God, a right that you do not have inherently in and of yourself. Jesus gives that to you when you believe. And you are then adopted into the family. You're made sons and daughters of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And you share in all of the spiritual blessings and benefits that God reserves for His Son and His children. He gives those to us. And we have the right to become the children of God. Those who are born of God are the children of God. And according to John, it's very clear. It's not by heritage. It's not by personal choice. In other words, you just don't decide, hey, I want to be a child of God now. Notice what it says. These people who become the children of God, who who Jesus gives the right to become the children of God, who were born, born again, spiritually born, not of blood. It's not a, 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 a blood thing. It's not a heritage thing, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It is by the divine plan and will of God. So I want you to stop for a moment and marvel at the grace and the mercy of God who stepped in and met you in your hopelessness, who met you in your helplessness and did for you what you would have never and could never have done for yourself. He provided salvation. He called you to salvation. He gave you the ability to believe and then He made you His child. And all of this is possible because Jesus came and lived and died and rose again. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a scholar, a teacher, a theologian, a pastor in Germany when Hitler rose to power in the 30s, 1930s. Eventually, Bonhoeffer, who had tried to remain neutral, who had tried to stay out of the fray, eventually he could not deny what he was seeing and what he was hearing. And so he was so moved then to join a resistance movement and And he was eventually arrested for helping 
a group of Jews escape to Switzerland. Later, he was implicated in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. After two years in various prisons and concentrations, concentration camps, he was executed just four weeks before the fall of the Nazi regime. While in prison, Bonhoeffer wrote letters to his family. He actually wrote prolifically during that time. And after his death, his family was reading through these letters, and, and one of them gained notoriety as they read it because it talked about his decision to join this resistance. He understood that even if they were successful in what they were attempting to do, his life would never be the same. And so he wrote to them that this one decision would define him. I'm here to tell you on this Christmas Eve that one decision can and will define your life. And some of you have seen Jesus as more than a baby in a manger. And you believe that He is the Son of God and the only one who can save. And so you have placed your faith and trust in Him as Savior and Lord and you've been born again. Others are facing that decision tonight. Perhaps you've never come to that place. You've never put your faith and trust in Jesus alone. Please understand this. That Jesus is, in fact, the light that came, who came to make an eternal difference by giving everlasting life to all who believe. And then that's the qualifier. All who believe. If you haven't placed your faith and trust in Jesus this evening, I invite you to do so. If you have, and you are a child of God, rejoice. Rejoice in the birth of your Savior. Rejoice in the life of your Savior. Rejoice in the death of your Savior. Rejoice in the resurrection of your Savior. Rejoice that your Savior is coming again. Father, thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is the one true light. And that by him and through him, we can know you. By him and through him, we can have everlasting life. Lord, we're so thankful for that. And God, I pray right now that those who have believed, those who have been saved, I, I pray, Lord, that this would be a time of rejoicing and joy as we think about the arrival, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, our Savior. But Father, I pray also if there are those who do not know Him as Savior, who've never placed their faith and trust in Him, that God, I ask that even now they would call out to You and beg for Your mercy. That they would place their faith and trust in You. That they would see Jesus as the, the one and only light. The one and only Savior. That they would see their need for that Savior and turn and confess and repent and be saved. We thank you for Christmas, this time where we stop to remember who Jesus is, what Jesus did. God, we ask you to work in our lives, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.
Will you join us in lighting your candles?
Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star and they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way.
joy to the world. We will sing, sing, sing.
Thank, thank you all for coming out this evening and braving the weather. These guys did a great job. I'm so thankful to have this team that God has blessed us with. They have put a lot of practice in. I said, I told them I get the easy job. I just wave my hands. So they have to do all the hard playing. So we are really grateful you guys came out tonight to worship with us, to, to worship the Savior of the world, the light and life who has come. And perhaps maybe there was something tonight that you have a question about. I know our pastor who was up here earlier, myself, anybody on this platform would love to share and, and just answer any questions you guys have to know more about the light and life. Um, we also have one service tomorrow, so if you don't have a church to go to and would like to join us in worshiping tomorrow as well, 11 o'clock, we'll be having a regular worship service here in this in the same space. But one service tomorrow, 11 o'clock, please, please be safe as you drive home tonight. And if you wouldn't mind helping us out by taking those, um, the light up candles, I know we didn't do the real ones this year, bah humbug, you know. We don't have to clean up wax tonight, but if you wouldn't mind dropping those off in the baskets on your way out, we would greatly appreciate it. Merry Christmas and, and have a, a safe trip home tonight.